we are now going to turn it over to our last session of the day. And uh, this is what should your plan documents and SPDs say? Uh, Andrew Holly and Bob Sang will be uh, presenting to you. And uh, I'll turn it over to Bob and Andrew. Great. Thanks, Liz. So uh, this is Bob Sang speaking. And, and I'll give Andrew a moment to introduce himself in just a second here. Um, Employee Benefits Webinar, Friday afternoon, first week after Memorial Day weekend. And Andrew, you and I have been moved to the last. I'm not sure if that's because we're good closers or if they just figure no one will be left. Um, but uh, we'll see. Um, Bob Sang, again, is the name. I've been with Dorsey for about a year. Prior to that, I was uh, with Target as a, a pain benefits lawyer inside, and I was with the firm for a dozen years before that. And um, excited in a, in a, in an ERISA-ish sort of way to talk plan documents for the next 30 minutes. Andrew. And I'm Andrew Hawley. I am a uh, attorney in uh, Dorsey and Whitney's trial group, actually, where I do largely but not exclusively employee benefits matters. Uh, I've been here for about 15 years, and I hope to give some uh, insight as to how uh, the issues are, the plan, the plan document issues are litigated and some advice as to how you can protect yourself should, uh, should, uh, should you find in anticipation of such litigation. Yeah, so, you're, and you're kind of getting sweet and sour here. I'm not sure who's sweet or who's sour, but, um, Andrew is a litigator and I am an advisor. Um, so I, I think that's a good combo pack to have when we're talking about plan documents because these guys really fulfill a number of roles. I think oh, properly done, plan documents can be an enormous benefit in plan administration and day-to-day -day, uh, work uh, in the trenches making these things go. And done properly, um, they assure that people like Andrew can come in and go out in relatively short order. They can be very useful in dispensing with claims. And I guess if there's one theme today that I would really like to present is that when you get into litigation, there's lots of means and mechanisms that you can get rid of litigation relatively early, uh, at least if, you know, if the facts are on your side and the law is on your side. And, but, but one of the easiest things to trip that up, one of the easiest ways to trip up a dismissal that would otherwise be granted and otherwise be relatively easy to get is if your plan documents are not in order. Because in these early sort of dispositive motions we're talking about, these early ways to get rid of the case, one of the things you really, really need to do is you need to be able to convince the judge that you've got the plan documents, that there's no ambiguity about what the plan documents are, and that on their face, they're clearly the plan documents. And if, if, that's, if there's a problem there, if your plan documents are, are not quite uh, uh, as, as clean as they could be or if they're not as consistent as they could be, then suddenly a, a, a crafty plaintiff's lawyer can say there's some ambiguity about what the plan documents say, and suddenly you're in the expensive discovery part of the, the case. And, and so hopefully some of the advice we give here today will help you to avoid that, that possibility. Good. Okay. So um, now I should say that you have a, a detailed outline in the in the documents that you received by email, and you have a, a slide deck that those of you that are viewing online will see. Um, I can tell you that the that the the captions from the slide deck correspond almost one to one. I think, in fact, they do correspond identically to headings in your outline. So um, uh, that's not a bad place to get more detail on some of these topics if you're looking for more information. All right, um, what must you have for plan documents? Slide one, a summary descri plan description will do the job for your plan document, sort of. Um, uh, ERISA actually requires a written document for an employee benefit plan, and in most cases, um, it doesn't take someone of Andrew's caliber to convince a court that an SPD is enough. The Internal Revenue Code also requires uh, a written document uh, for group health plans. But in most cases, what we're going to find is that the SPD is enough, but barely enough. So we're going to preach to you a little bit today, um, sort of this theme of, of those of you who don't have wrap documents yet really it need to start thinking about them. Now, I think that um, our slides are just a little bit out of order, but that's okay. I'm going to flip to the next one, um, and, I, and I believe that's where I wanted to start. Um, but I've already given you the talk there, so I'm going to forward to um, uh, the third slide. Now, this is sort of – it's interesting, you know, it, it trying to – convince busy employee benefits 
people to create a wrap document is sometimes a losing proposition for those of us in the law biz. Um, because it takes time to put these things together, and there's no single reason why you need them. As I mentioned just a few minutes ago, um, most people can find enough paper to convince uh, a regulator or a court that they've complied with the law requirements for a plan document. Um, so getting a little more involved and a little more sophisticated in, in terms of how you document your group health plan um, isn't easy to justify with one single sentence. So what we're going to do is give you a, a relatively quick parade of horribles or perhaps parade of reasons why you want some more detail around how you run your group health plan and why you would want it in your plan document. The first bullet on the slide is a reference to the ACCA 4980H details. 4980H is the code section under the Affordable Care Act that talks about how you need to make offers of appropriate coverage of health care uh, to 95% of your full-time employees this year, last year it was 70%, or you pay a penalty. Now, it's sort of an evolving theme in health plan design and ACCA compliance it goes like this. Those 4980H rules under the statute really describe how and when you might have to pay a penalty. They don't say you must cover all full-time employees as defined by 4980H. They simply say if you don't make the right offer to the right number of people, you might pay a penalty. And for a lot of reasons, some employers' eligibility rules for their group health plans might not match one for one those rules in the Internal Revenue Code and the Affordable Care Act. But you need a description of how you will comply with those rules and how you will identify your full-time employees for purposes of your ACCA reporting and your penalty exposure. That's not the kind of junk you want in an SPD or an employee communication, but it has to be written down somewhere. So I think kind of the, the, the future for documenting group health plans will have a relatively detailed appendix um, that describes an employer's approach to 4980H. Andrew, does that make any sense to a non-planner litigator? Yeah, you know, and I, I don't have as much of an opinion on, on the details of how that's done, but I think that, you know, what we're talking about here is, is you, 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 again, the, 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 the theme here is you want to be able to have everything consistent and on its face uh, obvious to a court as to what's going on and to what it all means. And by having, you know, and by having some of this information in a wrap document and then having a separate SPD that's also made clear to be part of the plan document, I think that you can, you can achieve that because you have some more clarity and things are consistent and you don't have a lot of junk in the SPD that, quite frankly, you don't need. And, frankly, a lot of these rules and information might be relevant for more than one of your benefit plans and then you can have it in one place rather than have it in all your separate SPDs. Exactly. You know, I, 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 Andrew, I spoke yesterday with one of the people in the, um, in the live uh, in-person seminar that we did on this topic, and they said that their SPD was 700 pages long. Um, and, you know, it's, it's valuable bandwidth, valuable, valuable capital in a sense that you're spending with your, your employees when you send stuff like that to them. And I think there's a lot of merit in thinning those things down so they actually get the benefit that you want them to have. Um, okay, continuing through this sort of list of none of these are, are must-haves. Um, and the precise nature of your plan document will really be a reflection of the nature of your business. Companies that do a lot of buying and selling, you know, um, I spend, you know, a lot of time doing sort of um, custom tailored written actions and resolutions for a company that, that might be buying three or four companies a year or probably, you know, several more than that. Um, and a lot of that time, a lot of the staff, a lot of the management time, a lot of the hourly lawyer time um, can just go poof. It'll just go away if you have some of those basic starter rules in your group health plan document. Um, in particular, in the M&A world, think about the time that, that those of you who deal with this deal with the issues around what to do with transfer of, of, of cafeteria plans, spending accounts, and elections, and things like that, and how you redo it every time you buy a company. Um, if you have something like that in your plan document, it can be a lot simpler. Um, 
I also have worked over the years with a number of employers who have multiple um, benefit plans within a controlled group. When I say controlled group, that's a group of sort of affiliated companies on the retirement plan side that becomes a lot more important concept. Um, but we'll have employers that have individuals moving from one subsidiary of the company to another subsidiary of the company. And for one reason or another, um, those subsidiaries have different group health plans. Um, and, you know, the devil is in the details of everything we do. Um, and those transfers can be made consistent, predictable, easy to administer with some common rules in a plan document that's sort of behind the scenes. Um, governance framework uh, is another thing that should be in any employee benefit plan, group health plan document, wrap document that you have. Things like committees, um, how the plan is amended and terminated, that's the next bullet, um, how delegations are accomplished uh, are things that are very useful in the document. And this is something that's really important. And you know, by wrap, what we're talking about here is something that governs, you know, a, a formal document that governs any number of plans, or at least even one plan. And one of the things that you see in litigation that becomes very, very, very prevalent is you'll have a document. It will set up a person who's responsible for amending the plan, or making claims decisions, or for making fiduciary decisions about service providers, or whatever it may be. And when the when the the document is perfectly correct and accurate when it's, when it's enacted, but you know, two years go by and that person is terminated or the job they worked at is is split into two or whatever happens and suddenly you've got somebody who's making decisions uh, appropriately wisely intelligently but they're not the person identified in the plan document as the person who should be making decisions and when you get into litigation suddenly you're asking yourself well the fiduciary who's supposed to be making decisions isn't making decisions and the, per and the person who is making decisions isn't named in the plan documents and that can cause trouble uh, again going with our theme here that you want to be able, always be very careful to make sure your plan documents are saying what you do and you do what your plan documents say. Uh, it's, it's very important to think carefully about what kind of governance framework you want and whatever that may be just to make sure you're following it and if it needs updating, you update it. Yeah, and Andrew, thank you. Uh, I'm going to double down on that for a moment. You know, the, notice, the, the notion of having these rules in place um, for when individuals move on to other jobs um, you know, it's valuable to the litigators, but these these wrap documents can also serve as sort of a, a procedures manual for a group health plan. Um, and, and having them in a somewhat formal document gives us all a little more discipline and ensures sort of consistency in the way the plans are administered. Now, I'm going to go off topic for a moment just because I, I forgot to mention something earlier, and I'm thinking of a question that we got yesterday. Um, someone approached me after the, the workshop yesterday and said, I have a wrap document and we distribute it to our employees every year. Now, terminology in this group health plan world is not real precise and it's not defined in ERISA, all right? Um, and this wrap plan phrase gets used in a few different ways. Um, a number of employers will have what they call a wrap SPD. It will contain sort of the base eligibility and other rules for a litany of group health plans, and then they'll have sort of substantive SPDs that get tacked onto them. What Andrew and I are talking about right now and where we've started this is, is what we think of as a wrap document that never really sees the light of day until there are problems. And when I say light of day, it never really goes out to the employees unless there's a request in litigation or something like that. So we're talking about something that looks a little more like your you know, 401k plan document that is used sort of on the inside. Um, and if you, if you want a little more slicing and dicing as to how um, some lingo that gets attached to these group health plan wrap documents. Look uh, earlier in your outline and you'll see some other, um, other language, other labels that get used um, in this discussion. Um, you know, a few more things. We need HIPAA privacy rules in our uh, group health plan wrap document and some of those can go in this uh, document that stays on your desk doesn't get distributed to your employees and that way you can have a little less language in your summary plan descriptions. Another bit of language that, that should be in, you know, Tim Goodman earlier in the seminar today um, 
talked about how the so-called Microsoft language should be in your group health plan document in SPD to avoid some of these employee classification issues. Another bit of magic language that should go in your group health plan document, and I'm going to look to you for a moment here, Andrew, Andrew is the so-called Firestone or discretionary language. Can you just uh, uh, elaborate? Pontificate, would you, just a little bit on this one? You know, we're going to talk, we'll, we'll talk about the last two in a couple minutes. We'll, we'll talk about those in a couple minutes okay. later on the presentation. I'll follow your lead, man. Thank you very much. I okay. appreciate that. Andrew, what is in the plan? No, what is the plan? So, and this is, if so the, one of the, there's no actual definition under ERISA of what a plan document is, other than it had, there has to be a writing, and the, the writing has to include the basic terms of the con, terms and conditions of the plan, and it has to explain exactly what, uh, how the plan is amended. Uh, you know, what once have been a, the, the court case Cigna versus Amara decided by the Supreme Court, the court made it very clear that an SPD is not a plan document, not by itself, not necessarily. It doesn't have to be a plan document. And that was a change to the law before. Uh, but now we know from the decisions after Cigna versus Amara that an SPD, the SPD that you use, can be a plan document. And this is a, a tremendous relief to all the, the uh, individuals out there who work in the benefits world, given that most of them thought the SPD was the plan document. So, so the, the answer to the question is that the, what is the plan is the plan is whatever you intend for it to be. But, and you can, and normally, oftentimes, the plan can be multiple documents. It can be a wrap document, which we've been talking about here, with multiple sort of appendices, which, are the, which, which describe the terms and conditions of the various different plans that are wrapped together. And those appendices can also serve as the SPD. Uh, you can have an insurance certificate. You can have an insurance policy that's part of the plan. But the most important thing about this, again, and one of the most dangerous things, things you see in litigation is you see where these documents are just kind of vaguely referred to as the plan, and nobody and there's inconsistencies between them, and nobody really does anything to meld those documents together, or they're not updated to be based upon uh, newest litigation. To give one example, uh, prior to Amara, when SPDs were not were, were kind of vaguely considered plan documents, or at least were considered effective, almost a, the, a huge number of SPDs had language saying something to the effect of, uh, this SPD is not the controlling plan document, and in, in case of any conflict, the actual plan document will govern. Well, in the world prior to Amara, when an SPD was considered sort of a quasi-plan document, but there were more formal plan documents, that worked out well. But after Amara, when the SPD wasn't the plan document necessarily, wasn't automatically a plan document, suddenly you got in a situation where people got in litigation and some magic language that they needed to enforce their case was only found in the SPD. So, for example, we'll talk a little bit later about the Firestone language, which gives the company the discretion to decide claims, or maybe it's an appointment of somebody as a particular fiduciary or something like this. And when litigation, when, you, when, the, when the defendant tried to come forward and say, hey, we've got our magic language, it's in the SPD, uh, what the plaintiffs did is they pointed that language saying, you know what, this, the, that, that the SPD was not the planned document, said the SPD is not the planned document, and therefore this language doesn't mean anything. And there's a number of cases where, based on that language, the, the plaintiffs, the defendants were unable to assert a, a dispositive defense simply because uh, it was not found in a formal plan document. So again, what is the plan? It's whatever you intend for it to be, but make sure, make very, very sure that you've explicitly said what you intend for it to be, that it's apparent on the face of the documents what you intend for it to be, and there's no ambiguity about that. You know what I think we want, Andrew? What's that? I think we want control. We want ultimate control over what the story is here in terms of what our plan is, right? I'll, we'll use the three C's, control, consistency, and clarity. Wow, three uh, C's. Uh, control, okay, I'm going to write that down. Control, consistency, and clarity is yeah. what we want. Go ahead and flip the slide. Um, and, 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 you know, there was a time when there was, the, and this is a good, good segue, I think, um, when there were fewer channels for communication around group health plans, all right? And in that time, the SPD worked better, and it was the better sort of source of all uh, coordination and all the rules in an employee benefit plan. That ain't the case anymore. And that's another reason why the, the behind-the-scenes wrap document is useful, is it gives us control and those other two Cs that I've already forgotten. Um, but it's very valuable that way. Um, and, you know, one of the sort of the, the, the notes that we put out advertising this webinar was 
we wanted to talk a little bit about how to tie all the different documents and lines of communication for your group health plan together. And this slide is intended as just sort of a, you know, starting on the deep on the inside and, and at the bottom going to the outside uh, litany of documents that might get used. So you've got the, the behind the scenes wrap document we're talking about. You've got the summary plan descriptions, which sadly in many cases have become so big um, that, that they really aren't a, a good, uh, the employees don't use them. They don't look to them much. Um, uh, we've got the summary of benefits and coverage, which I actually think is, is, is not bad. The regulators have not screwed that one up too much yet, and I think that's actually kind of a handy tool. Um, but, you know, the, the stuff that does the real heavy lifting in terms of a day in the life of your group health plan are open enrollment materials, websites, apps, social media. Um, the, the ways of describing what's available in these plans, the channels are really starting to increase. And the theme here is that they should all be consistent, and in my opinion, in one way or another, they should all tie back to the wrap document as the sort of the source of, of final rules. And, and I'll just say, but the only thing I will say, and we don't have time to go into the whole details here, but just remember that ERISA has rules and requirements, not only that say that when you have to pr produce documents automatically, but that give participants the right to request them. And one of the very common uh, errors that happens in the administration of employee benefit plan is that those kinds of uh, requests are either not misunderstood or they're ignored or you know, they're not properly responded to. And, and the failure to do so can lead to penalties and problems with your claim process so you know again I don't have we don't have time to summarize them but I would suggest that just know that they're out there and seek uh, seek, seek assistance if you get something that seems like a request for documents yeah and you know those rules that require responses to requests for documents um, are serious stuff and it's a great way to start a, a dispute out on the right foot by responding to those in a timely fashion with appropriate documents and the word appropriate is important because you don't have to give everything you have to give some things but not everything and frankly Frankly, can change by jurisdiction, and if you're and you 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 want to do what you got to have to do, but you don't want to do what you don't have to do. So good. We're going to speed through this slide to to get to kind of the end, which is a little bit includes some useful storytelling. I think um, the the wrap plan that we have been preaching about here um, should there's a few um, really uh, these are probably must-haves um, that would go in any type of wrap document that would be um, committee descriptions at a high level if you're going to have them claims responsibility again at a relatively high level and authority for delegations for example who can amend the plan um, so you want to give careful thought to how your plan is governed as you put a wrap document together. Let me also just do one more little editorializing piece here, and that is um, uh, it, it is not at all unusual in my experience for um, an employer to kind of get up Get, get things moving and rolling and get some energy and budget going and, and put a wrap document together. Um, and oftentimes, just because it's sort of occupational hazard for all of us, we get more detailed rather than less detailed when we put these things together. Um, and then we put them on the shelf. Um, and then we forget about them until we really need to go grab them again. And lo and behold, um, the detail is too specific and we're not sticking with it. Um, things have changed and we haven't changed the documents. That's a bad, 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 bad thing. So, you know, I think an effective wrap document is one that really should be dog-eared and sitting on your desk or, uh, or, or on your desktop on your computer and consulted regularly. And it's one that should be updated regularly as well. All right, on to you, Andrew. So um, now we're going to talk a little bit in the time we have left about things that things can go wrong. And I've talked about this a little bit. You know, we've the most important thing is don't ignore your documents. Keep consistent with them. Keep up on them. Make sure that they consist. Uh, make sure that the documents say what you're doing and that you're doing what the documents say. Uh, you know, where we don't have time at all to go into the whole uh, uh, the whole idea of third party agreements or TPA or agreements with uh, third party administrators, but this is a really, really, really important area. Uh, you know, those third party agreements, uh, the TPA agreements, I should say, uh, 
uh, always have minefields in them, always have dangerous uh, issues in them that, that are not, not apparent on the face of the document. To give just a couple examples, examples, the one thing that many of you who have dealt with these agreements have to deal with with your third-party vendors is, you know, who's responsible for who's who's who, who's responsible for indemnification, what are the indemnification terms, and, the, you know, the third parties oftentimes will drive a pretty hard bargain on that. But one of the things that's very important is if there's one theme I can give you with those kinds of agreements, it's who's responsible for what. You know, the, 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 the nature of healthcare administration, the nature of healthcare obligations are changing very, very fast all the time. And oftentimes you're relying on the TPA, your third party vendor, to be the one to know, to know what's going on and to be the one to have, have policies and procedures out there to make sure that you're complying with it. And you want to make sure that, the, that your agreement with them reflects that. To give just one very, very fast example, you know, the, the, the Department of Labor is very excited about the mental health parity rules. And those rules not only govern what happens to your plan, how your plan can be structured, but it also deals with how, uh, how, how your plan is administered. And what, what, is your, what is your agreement with your third party administrator who has policies and procedures say about who's responsible for that? Are you sure that they're doing a good job? And make, cause, because you could be liable if your third party administrator does a bad job. Are you sure that your third party administrator is going to reimburse you for that? Is your indemnification provision strong enough for that? It's something to think about. And of course, you know, in the days and under ERISA when we're so concerned about fees, uh, you know, you have to be very careful to know who's getting paid for what and are there any concerns about that under ERISA, particularly with ERISA's, you know, terribly esoteric and terribly annoying prohibited transaction rules. And the last, uh, you know, with the time we have here, the last uh, provision that we're going to talk about is just some provisions in your plan that you might want to think about. Some of them you, you absolutely should have. Some of them you might want to think about uh, to go through them quickly. You know, the, the Firestone and discretionary language, this is an absolute must for any plan. You'd be a fool not to have it. And what this is, this is just basically language saying that you're clear. Whoever's deciding your claims or whoever's administering your plan has the discretion to make determinations about claims, about fiduciary issues, about, uh, about, about all of those those kinds of things that happen during the administration of a plan. And why this is very, very important is because if you get into litigation and, for example, let's say it's a claim for benefit litigation and you have this language in there and you give gave the claims to the decider the ability to make the discretionary determinations, that deter determination we reviewed for an abuse of discretion, which means that if it's reasonable at all, it will be affirmed, uh, even if other reasonable ch opportun uh, decisions could have been made. That discretion will not be given if that language is not in your plan. Statute of limitations, again, this is a limit on when claims can be brought. First of all, it's a limit on when claims have to be filed administratively, and also a limit on when claims have to be brought after the claim process is done. Uh, you know, these can, be, these can be in there so long as they're reasonable and there's no reason not to have one of those. A venue clause. This is a clause that says, if I'm going to be sued, you have to sue me in jurisdiction X and wherever that jurisdiction is. And again, there's no particular reason not to have a venue clause, at least for breach of fiduciary duty claims, uh, simply because of their size. You can ask yourself whether or not you want your employees to, who have a, a routine claim for disability benefits or health benefits or whatever it is, you might choose to have those claims to not have your venue clause cover those simply because of the inconvenience of your employees. And frankly, if it's a small claim, courts are less interested in enforcing them. But a venue clause is a very good idea, generally speaking. And recoupment and overpayment provisions, those are provisions saying that essentially that if you overpay someone or if you accidentally make a payment, you get to get those payments back. And it seems fairly obvious that you would, but that's not what the way ERISA works. And unfortunately, your health plan has to have uh, provisions, if you want to enforce it under ERISA, has to have provisions specifically saying if we make a mistake in paying you or if you engage, if, if a, a third-party medical provider engages in fraud or waste or, or inappropriate behavior, and takes our money, we get to get it back. And there's a million nuances to those kinds of provisions that, that, that can, we could talk about in a whole other, a whole other uh, presentation, but you need those kinds of pr provisions and you need to think to make sure that they cover the kinds of situations you might get in. Exhaustion language. You want to make sure your plan says you have to exhaust your administrative remedies. At least in some circumstances, courts say that that kind of requirement needs to be stated in the plan, or at least it certainly can't hurt to have it in there. And I assignment language, you know, you want to have something in your plan precluding a 
participant from assigning their claim to someone else. And the reason that becomes important is because we're seeing a lot of cases now where medical providers will aggregate 1,000 claims, 2,000 claims from various plan participants and sue everybody, sue 200 defendants. And if there's an anti-assignment clause in your, in, your, in your plan, that will preclude them from doing so, or at least arguably do so. Uh, you want to make sure that that covers not just benefit claims, but also fiduciary claims, because sometimes people make that mistake. Um, and well, there you go. Uh, the last thing we'll talk about here that's not on this list is, uh, you know, the, we, we talked a little bit about the indemnification provisions in the, in the third party, the agreements with your third party vendors. Uh, you want to really want to, not only you want to have those, but you want to make sure that those are really in your favor or on, on whatever side you're on. And the last thing we will, well, I'm not going to touch on here, well, it's not on the list, but I will very to touch on it is, and this is a controversial issue, but some plan sponsors are including uh, provisions in their plan that require all claims go to arbitration and will say that you can't raise it as a class action. It's a bigger deal in uh, the retirement plan, but it, retirement area, but it's something that some people are doing. It's, it's, it's a little dangerous in the sense that it's not clear that those are legal, and the Seventh Circuit just suggested, issued an opinion recently that suggested that they're not, but that's probably going to go to the Supreme Court, but it's something for people to think about. Good. You know, I think the theme, the common theme here is it is, um, it is uh, we're in an era where it is important to have some um, method of tying together the various documents that describe our group health plans and the rules that are used to operate those plans. Um, and it isn't one size fits all, but it is an important area both in res with respect to plan administration and for defending against claims. So I'm going to pass this back to Liz. I think we're wrapping it up here. That's terrific. Thanks so much, <clears throat> Bob and Andrew. And thank you all for attending. I hope you have a good rest of the day and a wonderful weekend.